What do these folks have in common? Einstein, Jay Leno, Madonna? Yes, they're celebrities, but they utilize a one liter, two plus pound mass of wet and squishy tissue, the least understood piece of matter in the universe. Their brains, like yours and mine, are conscious. It's science without walls. You are now attentively, consciously watching and hearing this program. What motivates you to pay attention? How do you think? How do you remember? How do you take in information and ideas, process them, store them in memory, and somehow retrieve them and use them in the future, like for our final exam? The least understood and perhaps most misunderstood two pounds of squishy stuff on the planet is your brain. Don't, don't take this too personally. I, I should have said our brains, all of them. We're going to focus on some ideas about consciousness. But first, just a little brain anatomy. We'll begin with a tool from archaeology, a core sample, used to sample soils and rocks and fossils, backwards in time, by drilling deep into the earth. Let's take a core sample of your brain, uh, metaphorically, uh, of course. <laughs> the oldest, evolutionarily speaking, parts of your brain are the deepest parts, the most modern, the most recent, the outer surface, the cerebral cortex. The brain is at the top of the cord, the spinal cord. That cord is encased in, protected in, the spinal column, the vertebrae. We're in the subphylum vertebrata. At the top of that spinal column begins the brain. This deepest and oldest part controls critical and vital processes, such as the heart and breathing. This is often called the reptilian brain and evolved hundreds of millions of years ago. So deep down inside, uh, there's a reptile lurking. The next region out is often called the limbic area, representing our more recent mammalian heritage perhaps tens of millions of years old. And finally, the most recent brain stuff includes the two cerebral hemispheres, left and right, each characterized by lobes. The outermost layer, only about two to five millimeters thick, is called the cortex, from a Greek word for bark. It's that thin outer surface of those cerebral hemispheres, the right and left hemispheres, that make you you and a homo sapiens. The brain includes over 100 billion neurons and a wide number of other supporting cells. Each neuron can have over 10,000 different connections. Those connections can be of many different types, perhaps 50 or more. Each of those connections, those interactions, can be modulated or controlled in various ways. The number of combinations and interactions are almost infinite. The neuronal connections are absolutely amazing. They are pieces of art in their own right. Neurons are miniature dynamic biochips, receiving and transmitting devices, based on chemical ion channels and electrical potentials across their membranes. There are sensory neurons, the basis of our sense organs, the basis of our information in from the outer world. And there are motor neurons, which activate muscles and enable us to produce actions and outcomes based on that sensory information we have taken in. The major part of our brain, the cerebrum, includes the two hemispheres and the outermost cortex. The right and left halves are connected by the corpus callosum, a large band of nerve fibers. You've already seen that much of the cortex is devoted to sensory processing functions. Other parts are related to motor functions. We can say, for now, that sensory and motor functions are fairly hardwired. We take in and process sensory information subconsciously. 
We may, as we saw in the last program, even have at least partially hardwired regions for the rudiments of language, which we also learn and use subconsciously. We know we can consciously hardwire portions of our brain. You're trying to do that right now, trying to learn, to store the information and ideas you are seeing and hearing. We know that we learn that we can internalize facts, scenes, ideas, words, vocabulary, multiplication tables, batting averages, and birthdays. We can call those up at will most of the time. We also know that we forget. But if we do forget something, we normally say, it'll come to me later. We have every confidence that the information is indeed up there. Most things we learn are not easily retrievable unless we continue to use them, including language, music, or the information from the last exam. If we don't continue to process, to retrieve, to use, to remember that information, it partially disappears. It doesn't disappear completely. It's generally there in a latent or somewhat diminished form. We can reinforce it, enhance it, recharge it with far less effort than it took us to learn it in the first place. Languages come back to you. Birthdays, names, faces come back to you. But neuronal connections need to be regularly stimulated or fired. Otherwise, they change. That's why the Use It or Lose It subtitle of this program. Use It or Lose It applies not only to individual facts, faces, and skills, but even to the ability to learn. The more you use it, the easier it is to use it. A good analogy is muscles. If muscles are not used, they atrophy, they diminish. The body decides to use its energy and talents in other areas for other purposes. And of course, if you do use your muscles, you strengthen them, you build them, you enhance them. It's as true for our brain and its neuronal cells and connections as it is for our muscles. The earlier we start to use that brain, the more it sets a pattern. The more we want to use it, the easier it is to use it. It's more or less like joggers and exercise enthusiasts. Once you get into that routine, you need it. You need to jog, you need to exercise. It simply makes you feel better. You're incomplete without it. It's the same with mental jogging, with brain exercise. Whether it's becoming a musician, whether it's learning languages, or whether it's taking science courses. We don't just live in the present. We have a past, a history, which we can consciously call up. We have a future. We can predict, project, and plan. We can generate ideas. We can generate fanciful and even fictitious images. We have control over much of the activity of our brains, control over those neuronal connections, their strengths, and even their types. We are conscious. There have been many recent popular books on the subject of consciousness. The author of one of the very best of them was in Salt Lake City recently to give two lectures. Meet uh, Dr. Susan Greenfield, professor of pharmacology at the University of Oxford. Welcome, Susan. Hello. Uh, Susan has written this wonderful book, Journey to the Centers of the Mind, and it's really the basis of this program of Science Without Walls. So I want to get you to read uh, a quote, if you're willing to. Oh, of course I will, yeah. Yeah, this one, the consciousness you're currently experiencing. So you just want me to read this out loud? Well, if you don't mind. No, yes. no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, Okay, the consciousness you are currently experiencing is the result of neurons generating electricity and squirting chemicals around inside your head. No product is being exported for appreciation elsewhere. Nothing is being translated back into the color red or the sound of a bird chirping. Everything happening in the outside world is reduced to the diffusion of free-floating molecules and the banal fluxes of ions and stays that way. We'll talk with Susan again later. Consciousness doesn't require sensory input or any output. When this program is over, 
you might turn off the TV, turn off the lights, perhaps go to bed, and just think, be conscious, perhaps review the day, perhaps review this program. It's all up there, millions of images and facts and ideas, all of which contribute to our thought and to our consciousness. Susan Greenfield has developed a preliminary model of consciousness. You know that the brain and its neuronal networks are three-dimensional, but we'll use a 2D model here for simplicity. Let's assume that there is a local group of neurons that are connected, perhaps even hardwired in various ways. They represent something. It might be an image, it might be a fact, it might be a birthday, it might be a smell. Just assume that they are there. Now assume that there are several groupings of such neurons, each group localized in a different region of the brain. Think of each of these groups as little nodules of information. She calls them epicenters. New epicenters can form. A new face, a new word, a new smell, some sensory input. They might even just form statistically. A couple of connections, some firing, a few neurons somehow talking to each other by mechanisms we don't fully understand. Perhaps the germ of an idea or a thought. But for you to be able to utilize that tiny thought, to process it, to think about it, Greenfield and most of the others writing in the field of consciousness say that that little kernel of activity has to grow, has to expand itself, has to be able to recruit other neurons, probably those in the immediate vicinity. Her model is spatially multiple, but continuously variable. That means you can have different things going on in different parts of your brain, in different parts of space, and those things can expand or contract it's like there's a competition for neurons. You're having many transient thoughts all the time, all kinds of sensory inputs, thousands of little epicenters of activity, which can grow or contract. Let's say that one little center expands, grows to become a collection of cells, which is now a more stable thought or idea. You might say that you are focusing on it, and by mechanisms which we don't know, that germ of an idea grows, recruiting its neighboring neurons. Assume that, simultaneously, another thought or germ of an idea in another part of that association area is also growing. There are probably hundreds or thousands of epicenters growing at any one time. Thought and consciousness is a competition between all those varying epicenters. The one, or two, or three that went out at this particular instant represent what you are now thinking about, hopefully this program and these topics. But a different epicenter could have won out. The doorbell rings, the phone rings, your little brother or son starts to cry, and you instantly focus on that event. That new input, new epicenter, grows. It's generally believed that children less than four years old have a much diminished ability to generate thoughts from scratch. They depend on sensory input to produce their epicenters. That may be why they have such short attention spans. But by the time they are four years old or so, they've developed enough hardwiring, enough brain structuring, that they have a library, a repertoire, a memory, by which they can generate their own ideas. They now have a history. They can recall. So thoughts and concepts and ideas start to become more spontaneous. How does an epicenter of neuronal activity recruit additional neurons? How does it grow? Here's Susan's explanation. Different groups of brain cells are recruited around this epicenter. Right. Yeah? So that's, they're like the circles of water generated around a stone in a puddle. Exactly. And yeah. the more extensive the ripples, the deeper your consciousness. Either more neurons recruited at any one moment, the deeper your consciousness at any one time. And those brain cells can be in different parts of the brain. They don't always have to be the same place. The same brain cell can participate in different assemblies of neurons. They're very promiscuous. They're not hardwired right. to just right. be in one type of consciousness. So this gives you a very dynamic um, right. Mod, to my mind, model for accommodating 
no two moments of consciousness ever being the same, which of course they never are. A cell that is activated induces the activation of its neighbors, who in turn activate their neighbors, and things essentially grow radially from the center out. This expands until it may run into a different patch of expanding neurons, produced by a different epicenter. Since it's very difficult to think two different thoughts simultaneously, presumably one grows at the expense of the other. There are examples of such competition in chemistry when two crystals are growing, often one wins over the other. Some such process may be going on with thought development. It's all focus, concentration, attention. Some folks have incredible concentration skills. They can be in the middle of a novel or even a textbook and the world can be crumbling around them, screaming kids, breaking dishes, and the neighbor's loud music. And it doesn't phase them at all. Obviously, this can be overdone to the point where damaging or life-threatening stimuli are ignored. It can also go the other way. If your transient epicenters cannot grow, you have a problem. The epicenters are there, forming all the time due to sensory input, or even forming statistically. All of those transient little thoughts and ideas swirling around in your mind. But you can't give your attention, your focus, your concentration to any of them. You flip from thought to thought, from input to input. You have an attention deficit. You cannot focus. You cannot concentrate. You tend to live only in the present because you really can't direct your attention to any memory, idea, or epicenter derived from the past. And you can't really plan or project on the future because that too takes attention and concentration. You can't get anything done. You're superficial. You have a problem, and it's sometimes called attention deficit disorder. On the other hand, if your epicenter grows and takes in so many neurons that there really is no room or no mechanism for other epicenters to form, for other ideas, for other thoughts, then you remain transfixed on that one thought. That may be okay for a short time if you need to focus and concentrate, but it may not be okay if it makes you unable to direct your attention to other things. This is a possible mechanism of depression or brooding where people are unable to develop other thoughts or respond to new inputs. We obviously need a balance. We need the balance of new thoughts, new ideas, new epicenters, fresh sensory inputs, essentially a transient short-term life in the present, balanced against concentration, focus, longer-term thoughts. We need to be able to assess new epicenters and very quickly decide whether they deserve attention and focus or not. We must be able to focus and concentrate and at the same time be attentive and responsive to have the flexibility to choose. If a brain becomes compartmentalized, so epicenters which generate in one place can only grow so far and can't cross into another region of the brain. And if that compartmentalization is strong and impenetrable, then there may be thoughts and activities that simply cannot connect. Depending on how that plays out and manifests itself, it may be a model for schizophrenia. So how do we get these new epicenters, these new thoughts? How do we get the process started? probably from three sources or mechanisms. Certainly from sensory input. Also from a sort of conscious recall from learned facts or images. And possibly just random, just statistical events. One or more neurons just happen to fire and interact. There's been a lot written recently about quantum models of consciousness. Not necessarily quantum in the little tiny quantum physics sense that we discussed earlier, but statistical, transient, unpredictable actions. Things happen. Neurons fire. The right neurons talking to each other, perhaps at the right rate and at the right time, 
produce a tiny thought, an epicenter, which may or may not grow. Many facts, faces, or memories are hardwired in specific regions of the cortex. So imagine now an epicenter generated here, and perhaps simultaneously, one generated somewhere else. How do they communicate? Here's Susan's view on that. The brain is exquisitely designed to communicate uh -huh. over large distances very, very fast. Okay. Um, 250 miles an hour. Right. And your right. electrical impulse can travel. Okay. So if it's 250 miles an hour and you're communicating that right. distance, right. So it's not required you don't to have, to have any other mechanism. That much right. about right. things, things jumping. You can have non-specific communication by these chemicals that are mediated with arousal that, in a sense, marinate bits of the brain and are, <laughs> and are released and will predispose the brain that when right. the fast, discrete, zappy electrical signal comes in, uh -huh. they bias the cell to respond negative or positively, you know, in a very uh -huh. strongly or, or in a resistant way. So it's this conjunction of chemistry and electricity in the brain right. that enables it to have very specific local communications, but at the same time for those local communications to be incorporated into a more global or holistic right. mode of functioning. Right. Connections between two growing epicenters is one model of creativity. Two different, unrelated, unconnected ideas which you have connected, combined, in a novel and new way, which perhaps no one has ever done before. A new concept, a new connection, a new invention. That's creativity. Sensory stimuli can produce transient epicenters in several or more parts of my cortex, and these epicenters can somehow induce other conscious cortical activity. For example, I like to listen to certain kinds of music when I work. Certain types of music seem to facilitate my thought processes, my study processes. Why? Well, perhaps because that music generates its own epicenters in my brain which somehow facilitate the production, the growth, of my thought processes. There is certainly a synergism and a cross-brain communication mechanism which may or may not involve the neurons in between. Some even speculate that it's some sort of electromagnetic field. Remember Christian de Deuve and his remarkable book, Vital Dust? He argues that there may be some special manifestation of matter in the brain, that it may have properties not yet included in physics. If so, this would not be the first time this has happened in physics. You can imagine the awe, the incredulousness, when electricity was first discovered, and when the connection between electricity and magnetism was first realized or when the first nuclear physicists saw the bones in their own hands accidentally photographing them with those mysterious x-rays with which they were working. There have been lots of surprises in physics and in science in general. De Dove would not be surprised, and neither would I, if the brain provides one or more new surprises for physics. I'm quite happy with boring old Newtonian, ploddy old boring Newtonian physics <laughs> uh, for, for serving my needs. And so uh, if it ain't broke, you don't fix it. You know, like, I myself right. don't feel a need to invoke anything further. Right. Susan, thank you very much for this fascinating discussion and for being part of our, our project. It's my great pleasure. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs> no, if you are interested in learning more about this absolutely fascinating and exploding subject, read Susan Greenfield's book and view the two lectures she gave in Salt Lake City. See your syllabus for details. The video series, The Brain with David Suzuki, five hours of video on the current status of brain research and understanding, is also very good. Well, uh, that's it for biology. <laughs> Next time we start to look at planet Earth. Enjoy and use your remarkable brain. Pity the poor scarecrow in The Wizard of Oz. Why, if I had a brain, I could... I could while away the hours Conferring with the flowers Consulting with the rain And my head, I'd be scratching While my thoughts were busy hatching If I only had a brain I'd unravel every riddle For any individual In trouble or in pain with the thoughts you'd be thinking you could be another Lincoln if you only had a brain. Oh, I will tell you why. 
the oceans near the shore. I could think of things I never thought before. And then I'd sit and think some more. I would not be just a nothing, my head all full of stuffin', my heart all full of pain. I would dance and be merry, life would be a ding-a-derry if I only had a brain. Whoa! 